good to have you here today. We have a baptism today. Don't you just love baptisms? I do. So this young lady's pretty excited. Operation Christmas Child is next week. And I thought this video was just excellent. And let me encourage you to take the time and the money and buy a gift for somebody who is not as fortunate as we are in this country. I think it's a beautiful, this is a beautiful story. And just go ahead and watch this and then we'll close with something. God loves sinners and he's provided the way for you and me to come to heaven to be with him and that's simply through faith. 6,000 people groups that are left in the world today, many of whom have never heard the name of Jesus Christ ever. Anywhere at any time that is less than 2% Christianity, they're defined as unreached. Unreached people groups are located all across the world. Now is the first time in world history we actually know who they are, where they are, and the possibilities of bringing the scripture to them exist for the first time in history. There's incredible urgency today for the gospel. Kitomondo. <laughs> Arriba las montañas hay mucha gente que necesita de Dios. Y es un reto grande que tengo de llevar el Evangelio por allá. C Company uh, Operation Christmas Child have been brought together by God's grace. And we're so happy that the partnership is working together to reach the unreached people groups. These boxes have an incredible way of blessing, opening up hearts to hear and respond to the truth, but also to give us access into areas that are restricted. The wonderment of it is that the prayer has gone forward with that shoe box. And by faith, the child's encounter is not with material things. By faith, the encounter is with things unseen, and they're receiving that for the very first time. In this century, and probably within the next decade, every single unreached people group will have the opportunity to receive the gospel. Jesus is the light of the world. He who follows him will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. God's message, God's word, that living word, is never dormant. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, it's true. Jesus Christ took our sins and he died on the cross and then on the third day God in heaven said it's enough and he raised his son to life. This is the good news and we've got a responsibility to take this message to the ends of the earth. that God can use that shoebox like that. It is, it's almost hard to believe that God allows us to have a part in his story of eternity, that we could possibly be reaching an unreached people group with taking the time and our resources, and I know it's expensive, we have to buy things just like you do too, and um, to be God to use us in that story for eternity. I think it is a beautiful thing and just ponder that this week as you begin if you if you would pack a shoebox that we'd appreciate that and we they'll be delivered next week and pray over the child that will receive your shoebox and their family. Don't forget that because that is important. I think we forget to pray but pray over who will be receiving that. Thank you. Now we're gonna have a baptism. Ready for that? Oh <laughs> no, 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 water is more. Anyways, this is Amanda Beitner. Come on, let's get her closer. <laughs> All right, uh, this is Amanda Beitner, and she has trusted Jesus as her Savior, 
and uh, we always teach, try and teach what the scripture says, which is to openly profess your faith in Christ. If you confess me before men, you'll confess you before his Father in heaven. So this is a public pronouncement of what Amanda did in her heart. Amanda, when did you ask Jesus to be your Savior? July 7, 2019. Yes. That was uh, this. Uh, that was a Sunday. If you can remember being at the park, uh, being at the park for uh, our church picnic, uh, I, I spoke a little bit, uh, just a tiny little bit, and I spoke for uh, about 20 minutes, gave a gospel invitation for anybody to invite Jesus Christ to be their Savior. She was sitting in back. I didn't even see her hand. Donna said, Amanda Beitler raised her hand to trust Jesus Christ as her Savior. So that's exciting to me. I said, whoopee, yahoo. And uh, that's wonderful. So anyway, she's here to profess her faith in Christ as her Savior. Uh, please know baptism does not wash away our sins. Jesus Christ has washed away her sins. And she's a new creature in Christ Jesus. So, Amanda, are you ready? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Hold on tight. So, uh, Amanda, among your profession of faith, and on account of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the future. Folks, I know there are some of you out there that have never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. And all it is is going public with your faith. It won't wash your sins away. It'll just do this. Tell everyone what Christ has done in your heart. Uh, that's what it is, a public announcement of that. So I invite you to call me this week and, and we'll schedule a date that we can go ahead and get that done. So, Donna? Alright, you can go ahead and stand to your feet and we're going to sing Thank you to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning started with a future past. And uh, as we were, Tim and I were doing our family devotion last night with the kids, um, this thought tied into a future past that there has never been a time in your past where God hasn't pursued you, where He hasn't loved you. I know our earthly relationships make us feel like uh, parental love is conditional, or friendship love is conditional, or spouse, the love from our spouse is conditional, but not with God. He has always pursued you, even at your ugliest. And I know for me that's, I'm the chief of the sinner, so get in line. Um, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to sing that this morning. We're going to have uh, my brother Andrew here. He's going to go ahead and lead us in that.
don't deserve what you give us. So if we are really going to walk in your way, help us to love, not just like, but love those that make us mad, that we don't like. We need you to help us supernaturally, supernaturally this morning, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Please be seated. We're going to receive the offering now, and I just want to say, wasn't that a great baptism? Amanda Beitler, yay for Amanda! Our hope is that she learns just to take steps and walk with Jesus, the author and finisher of every one of our faiths. So I ask you to just pray for her. And then I want to say this. Uh, today at 2.15, if you would set your phones. Uh, today at 2.15, we are going into the prison. Our prison team is going into the prison. And honestly, uh, I absolutely, uh, it is wearing. I Honestly, I'm worn out by the end of the day. But uh, I thoroughly enjoy it. I've never left the prison where we didn't say we, we, we felt and, and heard God speak. So, uh, would you please pray for us at 2.15 today that God opens the hearts of every one of the hearers here today. We are speaking on uh, the book of life. Is your name written in the book of life? It rises and falls on eternity with the book of life. So, anyways, uh, we're going to do that. Beta? Yeah. All right, so we're going to have the ushers come on up offering. Um, yeah, you know, observation from this morning, first of all, I don't know about you, but it's been a great morning in the house of the Lord. Really, really good. Um, you know, we have no idea, right, where we're sending forth our arrows. And that was one of the themes of our, of our study this morning, right, for, for the, these young guys who are in our room. We have no idea. Like, workers, politicians, mayors, <laughs> I have no idea. You know, football players, who, who knows? Whatever they do, though, you know, it, it's pretty interesting. Um, a, a guard at a prison, but if you could be, all the, any of those occupations, but if you do what we saw today, Micah 6, you know, uh, basically love mercy, uh, walk humbly with your God, yeah. and 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 love justice and seek justice. I don't care what you're doing, man, woman, in this future. If you're doing that for the Lord, oh man, that's it. That's where it's at. And it's such a wonderful thought of where the, this future generation can go. Yeah. way beyond anything that we've done or, or that we can do. Um, so pray for them. And as we pray for our offering, Tone, I'm going to ask if you would pray for our offering. But, uh, you know, just guys, just also remember that, uh, you know, in here, we're just trying to build up for the Lord an army that is mighty, mighty for Him. Uh, so He can use us in any way He wants. So I'm going to ask you guys to bow your head and close your eyes as Tony prays for our offering. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for waking us up this morning, start us on our way. Yeah. Lord, I pray over this offering this morning, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you, you use it for what is needed to be used for. Hey, also, Lord, I want to pray for the pastor, as well as the rest of the ministry that goes to the prison this afternoon, Lord. May you have a message that speaks to their tortured souls yeah. and that you just uplift their spirits, Lord. Also pray for us today, Lord, as we get ready to receive a message. Pray that it uplifts us and that it speaks to us, that it touches us, that it gives us the strength and the well-being, Lord, to spread the news about your will and your way. And I ask to ask you, Lord, just to continue, Lord, to just have mercy on our hearts and souls and just continue, Lord, to prepare us, Lord, for your kingdom. And I just give you all the honor, glory, and the praise. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Amen. 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 All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> You'll be praying up here one day, no doubt. Yeah. I'm like stuffed. It was it was really good. I've never eaten there before. Get right up. Get right up. Come on. Come on. You want to play? Yeah. You want to play? You want to play? 
Go. Ladies first. Go ahead. It was hilarious. It really was. Really nice. I'm really glad you brought me here. I'm really, you know, I'm just happy that we can uh, come out. Who's that? I love that little card at the end. <laughs> All right, we're in part two of our series called I Deserve It. I Deserve It. It's the perfect American theme. I Deserve It. So, uh, this week's title is I Deserve Condemnation, but he gave me a person. And it's starting with me, buddy, he did. I deserve condemnation. He gave me mercy. So, uh, next week we will talk about a little man with a big sin problem. So, and then today we are looking at a passage that tells us uh, about a woman who did some very bad things uh, and actually got caught doing some very bad things. She deserved condemnation, but because of God's grace, Jesus gave her mercy, and that be the truth. So, I would like to know this, if you could honest, be honest with me, I know you hate, I know you hate these questions, but uh, I can assure you it won't go on your permanent record. Uh, the reason I say that, I've been told all my life, this, unfortunately, Kevin, is going on your permanent record. So I couldn't wait to find out my permanent record, whoever has it and whoever keeping it. The only one I know is the Lord Jesus. He's keeping a perfect record and a permanent record. And, uh, and I know when I get there, he's going to say, what record? No, you're forgiven. I say, no, I want to see it. And uh, no, we, we don't have it. You're forgiven. So anyway, but uh, it won't go on your permanent record. But how many? of you have ever got caught doing something wrong. Ever got caught doing something wrong. All right, most of us, if you're not raising your hand, uh, you have been caught lying. <laughs> In church. And see how calloused over you are? You don't even care. You got caught lying in church. Because, honestly, everyone has been caught doing something at some point. Uh, if you just think back to being uh, when you were younger, you've been caught doing something. What are you doing in here? Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, it, I was always quick to make up a lie. So I was very quick. My brothers weren't as smart, and they always got whacked. But, but anyways, it's a bad habit to get into, uh, just quickly making up lies. So, But anyways, uh, if it makes anybody feel any better, I've got caught... Uh, uh, probably dozens of times red-handed. Dozens of times. I heard one pastor tell uh, about one time that he was caught. Caught red-handed. He said he, uh, when he, uh, people would visit his church, he said he had, uh, he, he, he would wait a while and then he would have all the new people over to his house after a certain time. They would visit his church, and then he would invite them over uh, to his house just to get to know them. Uh, he said one particular group he had over, uh, he had in his house, and there was about a dozen people, brand new people, kind of uh, that visited his church. He had a dozen people to his house. Uh, it was a great evening together, and it was time to go home. Time to go home, and it was getting <coughs> late. So... He said, okay, listen, I thank you for coming, and it's been a great evening. I'll see you Sunday. Half the people got up 
put their coats on, and left his home. Half of them did that. Uh, about half were left. Most folks, I know this, just because I've lived long, most folks have some kind of sense about them that they know when someone says, okay, you know, it's been a fun evening. Uh, you don't have to say, put your coats on and get out. <laughs> you don't have to say that. Most folks get the hint. It's time to wrap up, get your coats on, and I'll see you another time. So uh, I don't care if you go home, but you can't stay here. But <laughs> Fedor, we went over to his house one time, and he told us that. Uh, listen, it's time to go. He gets up early in the morning. He said, time to go home, but uh, I don't care if you go home, but you can't stay here. So, I'm like, what? I've never been so insulted in my entire life. But anyways, half stayed. Fast forward about a half hour, and the pastor said this. Again! It's late. Oh my goodness, it's late. Oh, and, uh, and I'll see you in church. And they just stayed. They just stayed. Okay, uh, uh, I've got an early morning. We have kids, and uh, the wife's going to get up with the kids, and uh, let's head out for the evening. It's over. But they just stayed. They just sat there. The pastor said, I was so desperate, I kind of just backed over to the wall and turned the thermostat up to 95 degrees. <laughs> he said, it took about a half hour, but our place was melting down. But they just stayed and sweated. They just stayed. He said to his wife, honey, uh, can I see you? True story. He said, honey, can I see you in the bedroom for a minute? We need to go check on the children. Because they're probably melting. <laughs> we need to go check on the children. Uh, and in the bedroom, kid's bedroom, he said, honey, I don't know what to do. I, I've been polite. I've given them, I, I'm out of hints. I don't know what else to say to these people. I dropped hints. I turned up the heat. You turned up the heat? No wonder it was hot in here. Yeah, I turned up the heat. That was me. He said, I don't know what else to do. These people will just not leave. What's wrong with them? His wife said, I don't know what's wrong with them, but be nice. Remember who you are. You're the pastor. Don't do anything goofy with these people. And the pastor then walked back into the living room and these six people were left and they still were sitting on the couch. Still sitting on the couches. And they looked on, they looked at that pastor coming back into the room with disturbed faces like, like this kind of face. They looked on him with disturbed faces and the pastor was perplexed. He said, first they wouldn't leave and now you're looking at me like I'm weird. Then the pastor heard his wife talking to their baby on the baby monitor in the bedroom. Aww. And the baby monitor was broadcasting in the living room. And the pastor said, my first thoughts, there's nowhere to hide. <laughs> Facebook, worst pastor ever. <laughs> worst pastor ever. He goes, I never did see those folks again at church. He goes, I'm sad about that, but I never did. So, he was caught. He was caught. Uh, none returned. Listen, it's the worst thing to get caught with something. It's the worst. Today we're going to look at a woman who was totally busted and she was in the wrong. Let's begin in John chapter 8. If you have your Bibles or phones or tablets, John chapter 8. Let's read that passage through these verses and let God's grace and power <laughs> speak to us today. John chapter 8. Starting in verse 2. There's some notes in your worship folder. John chapter 8 verse 2. He said this. John said this. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts. 
where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman that had been caught in adultery. Jesus is outside teaching now in the temple courts, and there's a group of people around him. And I'd say it's about the size, maybe, a uh, group of people of a home group. If you're part of a home group, it's about that size. It wasn't a big crowd, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, the Beatitudes, or he was big. But this is a small, little uh, 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 crowd that uh, he gathered, and he's teaching these people, and sort of, kind of, like a home group. And Jesus is teaching God's Word here. And the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they came busting in, with their religious robes and hats on and their tassels hanging down. They came busting in here and dragging a woman. And they're bringing with them a woman who is caught in the very act of adultery. In the very act she's been caught here. Very possibly drug out of bed. I don't know that. But very possibly drug out of bed and down the street. Disheveled and humiliated. Disheveled and humiliated and confused. You can... You can just imagine. I can just imagine. Folks, I don't know how you were raised, but I was raised to know this for sure, that it takes two people to commit adultery. Two people to commit adultery, and something's missing here. They just dragged this woman. The guy, he probably just stood there and going, no, she is bad. <laughs> She's bad. So they haul her away. Takes two people to commit adultery. Where's the man? Bingo, bango, no man. <coughs> Massive double standard. Massive. This woman is shamed to the bone. That's deep. Shamed to the bone, guilty and caught in the act. Some of you have been caught, <clears throat> and you know what those voices of condemnation are like if you've ever been caught. If you've ever been caught as an adult, Voices of condemnation. Life will never be the same. You'll never live this down if you've ever been caught as an adult. I don't know that we're that smart when we're younger, like really young. But we say, think pretty despairingly even when we're young. But uh, when you're caught as an adult, you think all kind of things. God can't use you now. We think many of those things. The condemning voices, guilt and shame. What's interesting to me is that you don't even have to be caught in order to feel shame. You don't. In order to feel shame, that old shame bug works its way in there somehow. You don't even have to be caught to feel shame. In fact, sometimes shame grows best in the private, in the quiet, in the dark. Those secret feelings of shame produce loads of quiet guilt. You say, well, Pastor, you're reading my mind. No, I'm reading my mind. Those secret feelings of shame and guilt. I heard a pastor tell of a man who was secretly looking at porn on his phone. And he did very well to hide it. And his wife didn't know anything about it. And uh, his wife grabbed his phone one day to check an email that she said, ah, I'll just dial up my email and I'll check it on your phone. She grabbed his phone and the husband slapped that phone right out of her hand. He said panic and guilt filled his heart. Even though he had a lot of that hid, panic and guilt filled his heart. Listen, he wasn't even caught. But panic and guilt filled his heart. Then he made up some lie about why he acted so odd. Oh, he just overreacted. Don't worry about it, honey. Don't worry about it. Look at his smile. Don't worry about it. He made up a lie. Shame will make you act out oddly sometimes. And most people, they just can't figure, why are they acting so oddly? And I don't know if it's all shame and guilt, but it'll make you act oddly sometimes. Folks, there's a there's shame in all kinds of sin. Shame in all kinds of sin. This story we're in is of, in, in, in John 8. It's called <coughs> sexual sin. So we're going <coughs> to part there a little bit because of the context. 
I remember my first look at pornography. I remember my first look. I was young, and I felt a, a bit dirty. Listen, I didn't know what pornography is. In fact, I didn't even know what to do with it. After I didn't even know what to do with these feelings, I just thought, oh my goodness. I didn't know what to do with my thoughts and feelings, and, uh, uh, but this is what I did know. I felt dirty, dark, and I felt the urge to keep it secret. I didn't look and say, look, Mom, look what I found. It's great. Look how in shape she is. <laughs> I didn't do that. I didn't do that. But I'm going to tell you this. I knew nothing. I didn't even know stuff like that existed at that age. They didn't even know it existed. But it stirred thoughts and emotions in me that drew me right back to those pictures. I was in the fire of conflict because my parents were Christ followers. Like real Christ followers. Not fake. They were real. <coughs> I was in the conflict of sexual sin and Christ in my life, if you know what torment that is. And most of you do if you think any length at all. Torment. It bothers you. No one has to say a word. It all bothers you right on your own. Guilt and torment. I was in the fire of conflict. The pastor, uh, I, was, I was taken to church. I had no choice. We didn't even think about it. No, I'm not going to church. Oh, that would be a stupid thought on my part. It would be a wasted thought on my part. My dad would have drugged me out of the house and we're going to church, boys. And so we didn't even fight it. we just get in the car and go. And, and, uh, but when the pastor would give an invitation and ask, please give your heart to Jesus, it was extremely painful to me at 11 and 12 and 13 because I saw my uh, I saw I started getting into things <coughs> around the neighborhood you'd be surprised what people throw away in the garbage and then you just go look at people's garbage when no one's looking at you you look at people's garbage and there's all kind of stuff in there but uh, I, 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 a pastor would give an invitation give an invitation to come to Christ give your heart to Christ and I would be so I would I would be in torment in fact, I hated his invitations. Because it was one of those churches that they gave 49 verses of invitation. <laughs> Just as I... And I'm thinking, oh, God. <laughs> In torment. In torment. Not just hating the invitation. I was in torment and in pain. I would think of rock songs. I am not kidding you. I would sing rock songs as loud as I could sing in my ears to drown out that pastor's voice. I would see things on TV and purposely let my mind go. And then my mother thought I was praying. But I was just thinking about TV programs to try and stop that voice. I would think about cartoons, Bugs Bunny, sporting events, anything to stop the guilt and shame because it was painful for me. Most of the time, I succeeded. I would sing right to the end until he would stop. I would do right to the end until he would stop. That's why I've told you, oh, listen, when I was younger, I got saved about 25 times because I would just feel the guilt. And my mother said, Kevin, you only need to receive Jesus one time. Yeah. I couldn't tell her, you don't know what's rolling around right here and right here. I need about 50 times to get saved. I need a real dose of something. But she didn't understand it because I never showed her anything. Or my father. I asked forgiveness hundreds of times. Hundreds of times. You say, aren't you exact? Hundreds of times I've asked forgiveness. And I kept my word when I'd asked forgiveness, at least for a day or two. <laughs> Hundreds of times so I can understand the torment of young people. 
because they just don't know that you need a good dose, a real good dose of Jesus. That he can help you. The center, listen, I kept being drawn back to the centerfold Miss February. She kept calling me back to the centerfold. I knew firsthand guilt and shame. I did. I knew firsthand guilt and shame. Many of you know what I'm talking about. It may not be sexual sin. It may be for you. You have a serious, serious problem with overspending. You say, well, that's not even a problem. Oh, no? Oh, no? Is that why you can't pay your bills? Is that why people are going down the tooth? Because they spend it on everything but what is right to spend it on. People do not honor the Lord with their, with their first fruits financially. They overspend. And then, of course, they can't afford anything. And that's for real. They can't. Because they commit the sin of overspending. Listen, out of control eating. You say, Pastor, you're a fat man yourself. <laughs> That'd be true. It doesn't lessen the fact that it's a sin against God to just eat like a pig. Or you can't tell the truth. You can't tell it. You've got in a groove and almost everything you do, you just tell a lie about. Or you shade it somehow. You just can't tell the truth. The whole truth. You tell half-truths almost all the time and then you pull up and park on the part that's true. And then you think you're okay. I've played almost every game human possibly to play. Liar. Liars, liars, me. For some, it's substance abuse. <clears throat> substance abuse in a can or a bottle or a pill or a powder or something. And it has got you strangled. For others, it's their temper. And I know you know that it's not really that bad. Just ask those around you that you've exploded all over. And how, how they feel after you've oozed all over them. Ask the guy that you pulled over when you're in an act of road rage. Ask him how friendly you looked coming up to his car to tell him off. Listen, for some, you have a critical spirit, and that's your default. You criticize everything. Some are obsessed with a fake life on Facebook. And everything you do revolves around getting likes on Facebook. And that really makes you okay. If you, get, if you send out a picture of you doing something fancy and then someone uh, likes it and they say, that's cool. And you say, huh, I know. And also, don't you know that's my real life? That's my real, I, I, you mean to say, that's my real fake life. So, and there are those that have been abused by someone in authority. Someone in authority, and you didn't do it. But you have the guilt and shame that goes with it. You didn't do it. Someone in authority has crossed the line with you. And yet you bear the guilt and shame of it. I did bad, therefore I am bad. That's what people think, many, many, about their own life. I did bad, and therefore I am bad. Someone did something bad to me, therefore I am bad. Listen, if this woman were living today, she's thinking I've blown it, and no one will ever want me to be just a wife. I am used and abused. Everyone that I'm around with the ladies, they say, you be careful of her. She's a husband stealer. Husband stealer. And no one would ever tell her to face. What for? You can tell everybody behind your back. <coughs> Why would you ever tell anybody to face? You can just tell everybody behind their back. But for this woman, she was literally thinking her life is now over. Life is now over. This is one of the top three sins. I read this. This is one of the top three sins 
in Jewish culture, <coughs> adultery. I don't know who makes the list. But adultery is one of the top three sins in Jewish culture. Adultery. Punishable by death. Back then, punishable by death. Many times, stoning. They would put them on the ground. I, I saw one video one time of they bury them halfway and then they stone them. People line up, pick up stones, and they stone them to death. Punishable by death. John chapter 8, verse 3 says this. They made her stand before the group, and Jesus said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And in the law of Moses, in the law of Moses, command, uh, commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, Jesus, what do you say? What do you say about that? Folks, these religious leaders didn't care a lick about this woman. They didn't. They didn't care about her. They didn't care anything about her. All they wanted was to leverage her to nail Jesus. That's what they wanted. Leverage her to nail Jesus. Jesus decides, if Jesus decides to stone her, then his reputation of love and forgiveness, they can muddy that all up if, they, if he decides to stone her. It's out the window, that reputation, because they can do things with that. They got some goods there. Or on the other hand, if he says, let's forgive her, then he's accused of condoning adultery. And they can do loads with that, that he doesn't care about the law. Doesn't care about the law. He just says anybody can do anything they want. Listen, verse 6 tells us this. They were using this question as a trap. So I'm not making that up. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a ba basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and, and started to write on the ground with his finger. Listen, if you could just picture this. Religious leaders all juiced up. Man, are they juiced up. You know how when you get that self-righteous attitude about you? I'm positive you know. <laughs> I'm just positive also that it's not so easily easy to just own up to it. But when you get that self-righteous attitude and you forget where you came from, I do that sometimes. And Donna said, Kevin, how could you think that way? Do you remember your past? I went, oh yeah. <laughs> Let's forgive them. <laughs> Listen, religious leaders all juiced up. A humiliated woman standing helplessly before her accusers. The real backstory is this. Let us crush, let us use her to crush Jesus. That's the real backstory. But it's not the front story. It's, no, she's wrong, and we need to uphold the law. The backstory is, let's use her to crush Jesus. He doesn't yell back. Oh, he could have. I'm positive he could have said the most personal, insulting things because he could see their lives. He could have said all kinds of things. I wish sometimes when I've been in an argument that I could have the power of Jesus because you could destroy people. But ultimately it turns on back on you anyways if you do that. But he doesn't yell back and rebuke. He bends down and writes in the dirt. And this is what he writes. Uh, as, you, as you think about that. Uh, the fact is, we don't know what he writes. You could look up all kinds of people. In fact, I, I, I saw someone today and it says, I know, I saw someone on the internet. Be careful about the internet. But I saw someone on the internet, they said, I know what he wrote. And I couldn't wait to say <laughs> And it was something from the Old Testament, and it possibly could, but you don't know for sure. You don't know any of it for sure because he doesn't show and we don't have a snapshot. And Jesus didn't say, for those of you watching and reading at home, this is what I wrote in the dark. This is, he didn't say that, so I don't know what he wrote. Uh, what, uh, we don't know. For centuries, scholars have debated what he wrote. I would really like to know. I would really like to know, but it doesn't matter because I can't know. Uh, two things come to mind, though. Now, almost across the board, many people say this. Jesus wrote the names, possibly Jesus wrote the names of these religious leaders' girlfriends. 
<laughs> Religious leaders' girlfriends. Now listen. These are girlfriends. These are hotties. Why would a high up religious leader not have a hottie? I went on the internet. This is how faithful I am to research. I went on the internet and asked for strippers' names. And you have to be careful about that because you'll get a whole lot more than strippers' names. But I was thinking what Jesus wrote that it would impact those men standing. I was thinking what Jesus wrote. These were some four strippers' names. Uh, one, I, I listen. If your name's this, I don't listen. That I got it off the internet. So, don't be mad at your parents for naming you this. So, but one of them was Amber. Okay, and that's not too bad. Okay, Jesus very possibly wrote Amber. And the older religious leaders are looking Amber. I know an Amber. <laughs> very well. And then another one's name was Candy. Candy, that sounds like a stripper's name. And then another one's name was Kitty. Kitty. And the last one was named Bambi. Bambi. I just took the first four because it was a lot of them. I just took the first four and hurry up and got out of there. And, uh, so uh, I didn't need to know any more stripper's names. So, but and Jesus very possibly wrote in front of these religious men. He wrote, Bambi, Kitten, Kitty, Candy, and they're standing there like this. No, they're standing there with their chubby arms crossed. I know they are. <laughs> they're standing there looking. Oh, Jew, stop. Jew, stop! This bad, bad, bad woman! Jew, stop. And then Jesus writes, Kitty, Kitty. kitty. I, know, I, I know a Kitty. I knew her last night. Kitty. Oh, what's he trying to say? Uh, and then he writes, Bambi. Bambi? I know Joe over there knows Bambi. Huh, what's he trying to say? What's he trying to say? This is, this is, this is kind of getting a little hairy here. And uh, if you're standing there as a religious leader, if I was standing there as a religious leader with my chubby arms crossed, <laughs> and ready to condemn, condemn this woman now. Condemn this woman, locked and loaded with judgment, oozing. Jesus on the ground in front of me, on front of me, in front of me, he would write, hmm, Kevin the thief. And I'd say, who's he calling a thief? Kevin, that's my name. Kevin the thief. Kevin the liar. I told more lies in my life before Christ. More lies. It was simple to tell a lie. A lie, you can create any story you want. You don't have to live because normal, we just all have normal lives. <clears throat> and a lie, you can do way better than normal. You can tell superstar stories. You can, anything, anything you've seen, you can lie about and make it sound absolutely wonderful. <laughs> and once you get in the habit of that, you can really accelerate that. Liar, Kevin the liar, Kevin the thief. And I would have to think, hmm, how does he know that stuff? I hate him. Because <laughs> I'm all juiced up with a judgment call here, ready to kill someone. I'm all juiced up. Jesus on the ground in front of me, written that, Scholars believe that the Greek language, this I just read this, I don't I don't I know a few little Greek words, but honestly, and I know a few Greeks that make pizza, but uh, <laughs> but that's as close as I get to the Greek and very good pizza too. So but uh, scholars believe that the Greek language points to that he wrote something against these religious leaders, the language lends itself to that, that he wrote something against these religious leaders. He just didn't doodle in the sand. He wrote something against them. Jesus spoke up in verse 7. It says, when they kept on questioning him, kept questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at this woman. They said, 
Jesus, should we go ahead and put her to death? He writes and then stands up to face them and said, let any of you that is without sin pick up a stone, here's one, pick up a stone and cast the first stone at her. John chapter 8, verse 8. Again, Jesus stooping down and wrote on the ground, at this, those who heard him began to go away. At this, those who heard him began to go away. One at a time. Who was first to go away? Yeah, the older guys. The older guys. Probably the ones that recognized Bambi and Kitty. And they and the other guys are kind of maybe too stupid to go away. No, no, they're, they're still going to finish it. They're going to finish this. The older guy says, the older guys maybe said, okay, I see this. I see where this is going now. I see, and the older guy said, I'm sure, listen, if it would be me there and, and the liar I was, I would have said, no, let's have mercy on her. After they start writing all my girlfriends down, down names down, I said, let's have mercy on her. I'm out of here. Let's be merciful today. Covering myself again, of course. I always covered myself. Always covered myself. Most people do. I'm just being honest about it. Most people just cover their own tails. And I did. The older ones must have thought, listen, I see where this is going. Then they all left. It says they all left at verse 10. That Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir. No one, sir. She said. Then he says, Neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared. She says, Neither do I condemn you. Everyone is gone. She stands alone with Jesus. Jesus says, No one is here to condemn you. Then verse 11. No one, sir. She said, Neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared. He says, go now and leave your life of sin. Go now, and I think King James says, sin no more. Listen, folks, here's what you will see. Here's what I hope you will see. With all assurance, uh, she deserves condemnation when you think about God's standard. I'm not talking about my standard. I cannot condemn anyone. Are you kidding me? That would be a ridiculous position for the idiotic life that I've led in the past. I can, I, I, it's just not up to us to condemn anyone. But she deserved condemnation. She was sinful and she was wrong. But because of the grace and love of Jesus, He did not give her what she deserved. But instead, He gave her mercy. Gave her mercy. The good news is that those of you who are in the same place, full of shame and guilt and condemnation, that's the good news. You can find what she has found. Now this is the last page. And so, that means we're almost done. But I want to tell you this, before you leave and before I forget it. You say, well, Pastor... I'm not a prostitute. I'm not in a sinful situation. I don't know. I'm not a liar. I've tried to be honest before. I Listen, I even watch how I spend. I'm not crazy that way. Okay. But please know this. I'm going to believe you're not, because I don't know. I, I, honestly, that's your business. But I want to tell you this. There are loads of people trapped in sin. If you yourself are not, if you are, then here's the antidote. Jesus' love and forgiveness. But let's say you're not. And I'm recognizing that fact that you're not. Trapped in sin. Some are, some aren't. Most aren't. Here that I've known you. I've known your life. But there are so many people all over our Harrisburg area that are. Take this story 
and use it for fuel in your own life to rescue the perishing and care for the dying, dying in their sin. We are foolish if we don't use this story to motivate us. When you go to the grocery store, strike up a conversation, Honestly, I had an opportunity to talk to someone at Sam's Club. I always end up at the snack bar after <laughs> Sam's. <laughs> you can't beat that hot dog and Coke for $1.50. <laughs> and there's people all around you. <clears throat> all around you! Take this story and use it for fuel because he is willing to rescue the parish. The rescue the perishing that are perishing in their sins. And you can use it for that. I'm glad you're not caught up and no one drug you in today because of your sin. I'm glad that about that. But use this as fuel. Alright, back to the last page now. Good news is you can find what she has found. It's the medicine for your guilt and shame for those voices of condemnation. You're bad. Those voices go like this. You're bad. You're pathetic. You're dirty. No one will accept you if they really knew you because of your sin. You say, well, where did you get that from? From my own life. I've had those thoughts. You better keep it all a secret. <coughs> better keep it all a secret because no one will accept you if they know about your life. Keep it a secret. And so you deal with all of that you can't speak because you still want people to care for you. Not true. You're dirty. What I have done is unforgivable. How about that one? What I've done is unforgivable. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not! You've been lied to! It's not. Folks, it's not true. Jesus forgave her, and he will forgive you today. Forgive you today. You say, well, Pastor, this is, this is the problem with our congregation. We've been here a long time, and people perceive something about you. Oh, no, they're good people. Oh, no, no. No, they've been in church a long time. No, I know them. They're outstanding Christians. And so you can't fess up to anything now. You can't. Because this is what someone said about you. You're a good folk. Good folks don't sin. Don't they? Yeah, they do. And you can't fess up because of what they think about you. Now they won't think that about you. He did that all these years. I thought he was that room. It's all a lie. And we just keep it stuffed. Keep it stuffed. And the guilt and shame rears its head. Oh my goodness, it's horrible when it rears its head. I can usually pound it all down. But it's like whack-a-mole. Did you ever play that game? <laughs> whack-a-mole. You can't get all those moles. You can't just keep pounding them down. Whack-a-mole. You eventually lose. In fact, I usually get two or three people to play with me. <laughs> See? Natural one cheater. <laughs> and they stand there. I say, you take these three. You take these three. I'll take these three. About nine. And everybody has their own three mole heads. <laughs> and you win. But you don't really win. I've had people come over and say, Sir, sir. <laughs> that's not how you play whack-a-mole. I said, isn't the idea to whack all those things in the head? I just call my buddies here. And they say, no, no. No, don't do that again. Or you won't be playing whack-a-mole anymore. Oh, I like whack-a-mole. But... So, you can't keep all the mole heads down in your life. Turn to Christ. Give Him. He has set me free from my sin. Listen, in John chapter 8, verse 12, 
Soon after, Jesus said this. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said this. I am the light of the world. Whoever, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. We will have the light of life. And that is what has happened to my life. I've had people from my hometown of Mount Pleasant say, Kev, Kev, they haven't seen me for years. First thing they say, what happened to you? And I honestly, my first tendency, I have to make up a big story, what happened to me. And I said, the only thing that's happened to me is I bowed my knee and asked Jesus Christ into my life. And he has radically changed my life. And they said, huh, uh, no. And they were all done with me. They thought something miraculous happened. Like, that's not miraculous. <laughs> and I said, Robbie, you know my life. You know how it was. You know the bend I had. I know. I grew up with you. That's exactly what happened. Jesus Christ changed my heart. That's no more, no less. And that's the message we're carrying into the prison today. That Jesus Christ, you no longer have to be bound by what you're involved in. Finish your time, get out, bow your knee to Christ, change the direction of your life. That's our message. Folks, I'm going to finish with this. There is one name that I credit for seven setting me free. You would say, Bill Brown, your father. No, 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 no. Donna, your wife. She big, very big. But this one name is the reason I'm ministering in the prison today and not being ministered to in prison today. One name. It's the name of Jesus. If you hook your train to the name of Jesus, He will change the direction and the trajectory of your life. Hook your train to Him. Ask Him to come into your heart and become your Savior and then live for Him every single day of your life. That will change things. Just a small prayer and then go and do your own thing won't change a thing. It'll just waste your time praying a prayer. Give your heart to Him You'll change the direction of your life. That's it. Let's close it for Father, we love you. Thank you so much for even putting this woman's story in this book of yours about her sin and about the condemnation and about the forgiveness. She deserved condemnation and you gave her mercy. Lord, I for sure am one that can relate to that story. My bad behavior in this life, I knew better. I knew every time that I sinned, I knew better. And I did it anyways. I crossed lines that I shouldn't have crossed, and I crossed them. Because it became easy after a while. Lord, thank you for forgiving me, and thank you for providing an opportunity for anyone here today that would be brave and bold enough to reach your hand out to the one hand that is extended to you today from Jesus. It's the same thing in Revelation chapter uh, ch chapter 3 where he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I ask you today, is he knocking on your heart's door? Is he knocking on your heart's door? I ask you, if he is, would you open the door it's up to you because he will not just come in without you asking. Would you open the door and let him come in to your heart and take up residency in your life and take control of your life? 
He will make your life something that you never dreamed possible. Let Jesus have your life. With heads bowed and eyes pray, eyes closed, would you just, if you do not know Jesus, or if your life is off the road and into the weeds, would you pray this prayer quietly to the Lord and ask Him to come into your heart and ask Him to clean you up and ask Him for forgiveness. This prayer goes like this. I'm praying it just to help you just guide you in a prayer, but there's nothing magic on a prayer. The magic is in this, that you're crying out to Jesus for forgiveness. The prayer goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I realize today that I'm far from you and I need forgiveness. Like this woman in John 8, she needed forgiveness. And Jesus didn't give her what she deserved. He gave her mercy. I ask you today, Jesus, to come into my heart and forgive my sin and become my Savior. Today, I'm asking you that, Lord. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer and asked Jesus to be your Savior or asked Jesus for forgiveness even today and you made, made things right with Him today, would you slip up your hand in this private moment? I won't embarrass you. I won't come to you. Would you slip up your hand and say, Pastor, I did. I asked Jesus for forgiveness today. I did business with Him today. Would you slip up your hand? I won't recognize you. Yeah, I see that hand. Anyone else? You can put it down. Anyone else? Say, Pastor, I did. I asked Jesus today. I did business with Him. I did business with Him today. My life has been off. And I want back on. Today. Would you slip up your hand and say, Pastor, I did. I asked Jesus today for forgiveness. I asked Him to get me back on track. I asked Him today. Anyone else? Father, you saw that hand. I ask you today, if there's, I don't know, you know, you know the hearts of everyone here today, Lord. I ask you, please, continue to work in us. Continue to take this John 8 woman's story and spread it throughout the land that Jesus forgives sin and he will set you free. As you have started with me already, continue throughout this congregation, Lord. Continue to keep your hand on us. Bless us today as we go to the prison. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Folks, thank you so much for coming today. We're going to conclude. That concludes our service. Part 3 next week. Pray for us at 2.15. God bless you. You're dismissed.